Watching Walsall has always been a passionate affair. The club history now into its second century is rich in football nostalgia, even if honours have been few and far between. It's a very interesting time for Walsall Football Club because we're in the, uh, the process this season, of course, of leaving Fellas Park and uh, moving to the new stadium at Bescott. And we know, of course, that many of you have been coming to Fellas Park for years and you've been standing on the terraces and you've been sitting in the grandstand without really having a look, having the chance to have a look behind the scenes. So tonight, uh, what we're going to do is to give you that opportunity to visit various parts of the ground that perhaps um, you haven't been to before. What you will not be hearing about tonight is a succession of triumphs and cups and trophies and so on, because in our 101 year history, in fact, we've only ever won one championship, and that was the fourth division championship in 1959-60. And of course, we've never won uh, a major national cup competition. But nevertheless, it's a great story to be told, one full of character and one of fighting against the odds to survive. And of course, the occasional triumph when uh, as, a, as a small club, we've occasionally knocked much larger clubs out of the FA Cup or Littlewoods Cup. So it's a very good story uh, to be told here. And of course, it started with the amalgamation of two clubs where we have Walsall Town and Walsall Swift joining together to form Walsall Town Swifts back in 1888. And that was the original name of the club, the Walsall Town Swifts. Now, if ever a club's history has been dominated by a particular match, it's Walsall's history which has been dominated by that game hit here on Saturday the 14th of January 1933 in the third round of the FA Cup when Walsall were a struggling third division north side playing Arsenal, the greatest club side in the world. No one gave Walsall a cat in hell's chance of winning. And the result that day, which of course was Walsall 2, Arsenal 0, is still regarded as being the greatest giant killing feat in cup history. That is an original of the match programme produced that day. It was priced tuppence. The caption is, uh, the field marshal of the Arsenal says, is this the way to Wembley? And the teddy bear... He says a trifle intimidatingly, yes, for one of us. <laughs> this, the picture that you see over here is a picture of the Warsaw team that beat the Arsenal on January the 14th, 1933. And when you look at the picture, look at for one of the men who is sitting on the ground, cross-legged, he's got the ball between his knees, that man is Gilbert Orsop. And Gilbert Orsop is the only remaining survivor of the Walsall team that played that day, and of course he scored the first goal. But they would played no wings, not for the first five minutes. I didn't like it. I thought, well, I shouldn't get no goals. Because I got all my goals from Hancock's, you see, and Lee. Lee was a good left winger. Oh, he could hit them far post. And I knew that ball was coming, but he used to keep them just back from the goalkeeper, you see, to beat him. And I used to run onto it, and you catch it on your forehead every time. Like, yeah, that ball, you must judge it with it. For, that's why I lost my eye, this eye. Head in the ball. The third round of the English Football Cup has brought the Arsenal to Walsall. And here are the Londoners wearing white shirts. Walsall, an unpretentious third division team, come out onto their own ground to fight the leaders of the first division. Oh, that's in there when they beat the Arsenal. Our sub scored. <laughs> we have to hard body. 1933. What do you remember about that day? I was here. Daddy, oh, and um, the ball got sent off. Kick, kick the house up. You can't remember that one, eh? The house up, oh, was good, they were. They were some good players, aren't they? The picture that you see over here is a picture of the Warsaw team at the last full season before the Second World War. And when you have a look at it, have a look at a very young goalkeeper who's standing on the right-hand side as, as you look at the picture. And that man is Bert Williams, who, was to, who started his career with Walsall, but he was later to go on to play for Wolverhampton Wanderers and England. Uh, well, 
I suppose I must have been able to play a little bit when I got here, but uh, having come here, there were uh, one particular person, a man called Harry Waite, who was part and parcel of this sort of football game, and he spent a lot of time with me, a very good friend, and um, I've no regrets. Excellent start for anyone to come to walk with this. Football. So it's been a good family, homely club? It was, yes. Fellows Park. I knew the man that owned it, Mr. Fellows. He signed me, and when I was 17, for the princely sum of one pound a week. He probably paid me what it was worth. But uh, no regret. No regret. England winger Johnny Hancock's was another crowd pleaser, but everyone has their own favourite. Remember him, goalkeeper? Hancock's was playing, Hancock's, Wilshaw. Wilshaw was on loan from the Wolves. Massard, Lishman, Dave Lishman. Wolfsop was really good player, you know. And mind you, in that day we had plenty of good players, you know. You couldn't single one out, I don't think, for a moment. Tony Richards was one of the players. Uh, oh, Jim was bad. <laughs> uh, he was very, I was very keen on him. Plus, he used to get some goals. Oh, John, played for Wales. He was a good lad, Alan Booker. We had Dave Massard, Dave Richmond. Had some good football, isn't it? Ever since I can remember it, it's been a breeding ground for young players and the number of uh, people that started their career at this club and have gone on uh, to become you know, top class players with some of the best clubs in the country and got to international level as well. Uh, tells a lot I think for the fact that people like their, their children if necessary to come to a club like this rather than go straight in. in a lot of cases go to a big club where they can become lost. Such a big environment. And basically, what much of the teams that have represented Warsaw, certainly over the past 20 years, I think you find a large percentage of homegrown players amongst each team, as well as the ones that have gone on and become, you know, the main players in their own right at other clubs. Well, I first became involved with Warsaw Football Club uh, in 1947-48 season when I came down with my mother. Um, as a young boy and uh, stood behind the old laundry end of Fellas Park and had my first taste of glamour of football, you know, and uh, lived with it ever since. What was the atmosphere like in those days? Oh, a super atmosphere. I mean, Fellas Park was a very special place in a sense for me uh, and I think for all the fans who went there because it uh, had an atmosphere all of its own. The laundry was a feature that everybody knew about, the sloping pitch that we used to have. And uh, the players who used to play in them days, you know, were all stars to us, you know, in their own way. And um, I think it was a, a very special time and uh, in football, uh, nationally at that time, uh, through the 50s and the 60s. But we did uh, a smashing job, you know, in the third division south and, the, you know, and in the fourth division, the third division. Uh, and the fact that we're surrounded by so many big clubs and that we still retain this interest you know is marvelous you know and uh, of course the gates you were having at that time post-war they were big everywhere weren't they they were i mean we were getting i think the gates we were getting in them days were anything up to uh, 14 and 15 thousand i mean i've been on fellas park when a reserve game uh had about four to five thousand for reserve match you know uh but that was how football was i think to, at the end of the war and during the course of the 50s early 50s and 60s uh, but I think the game changed dramatically uh, in the late 60s and 70s, and I think Warsaw lost its fans in the same way proportionately as other fans left football. But those that remained at Fellows Park thrilled to two men who still share the club's scoring record of 184 goals, Tony Richards and Colin Cannonball-Taylor. The oldest lad I've seen hit a ball, I played with Colin when he came from Stalbridge, I played in the reserves against Stoke City down here, and the pitch was a quagmire. It was the old-fashioned case ball, leather ball. And he hit it, and it rattled the laundry, and I think all the rust on the laundry fence fell off. No, that's true. We always yeah, remember uh, in a, in a uh, practice game, first team against second team, and Frank Gregg lined up in the wall, and Colin was taking the free kick and he hit this ball, and Frank just, just fell flat on his face. Well, another time, he, uh, he took another free kick, he hit me on the leg, 
he spun me round and I'd, I had this imprint of the ball for two, week, for two weeks on my leg and he turned out into a rash yeah, as I big as that. my hand. Really? I remember that. Yeah. 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 I'll tell you what, there's not a player playing that can hit the ball like him. No, no. No one. I came in 1958. Virtually till 1973 when I finished. I left him twice. I went to Newcastle, back to Fellows Park. I went to Crystal Palace, back to Fellows Park. And then I finished it at uh, Fellows Park, 1973. I can't remember how many games, or 400 and some of them. So they say 180 goals or something like that. Common consent, one of the hardest shots ever in football. Oh, so that's reputed to be, yeah. I suppose it was well known in football anyway, we left foot, yeah. The nickname is Cannonball, I don't know if it's a press, I suppose, the nickname is. Yeah. I have happy memories here of Warsaw. Very lucky. Because I have a lot of happy memories on this ground. It's got a lot of goals as well. Well, yes, I was fortunate. I had a lot of help. Tyler, who uh, sort of by the outside of that, he got a tremendous shot. Um, I don't think a lot of goalkeepers realised it until the last moment. Um, they fumbled it, and I just, all I did was just went into the goal every time they shot. And I got a lot of rebounds. So, uh, so I had a lot of help, and I had nine happy years here. By the mid-70s, Chairman Ken Weldon and manager Dave Mackay had added much-needed stability to the club, with careful housekeeping very much the order of the day. For the first time, we're solvent, both at the bank and, and at the club. One man who knew the chairman better than most, player manager Alan Buckley. The one thing he hates is to see waste, wastage at any club, whether it's a light on in the room and nobody's in that room, whether there's eating on the room and, and, and there's nobody in that room. He can't stand wastage and he never rests until he's got a club running, uh, how he would run his own business and that's profitably of course. He's, he's a difficult and he's a hard man to work for, but one thing that, that I've found that, uh, that a lot of people may not know is he's got a, he's got a good sense of humour, you know, you can have a bit of a laugh and a joke with him and also what people may not realise is he'll let you argue a point. Well, my name's Mick Kearns. I joined the club in 1972 as a goalkeeper. Uh, I had six very successful years here with Warsaw. Then I got transferred to Wolves for three years, and then I came back uh, for another two years playing. I can remember we had a lot of characters at the club in, in those days, people like um, Bernie Wright, Roger Hind, uh, Roger Fry, Nick Athey, Stan Bennett. Uh, what I would regard as the, the old school uh, characters, I mean, you often hear people say about the modern game, there doesn't seem to be the characters in the game that there did years ago. Uh, and I would agree with that. I think uh, there's no character around now like Roger Hind or, or Nick Athey or Bernie Wright. And I, I've got a lot of pleasure out of thinking back uh, and playing alongside these characters. Of course, you had a successful time in the international arena while you were Yes, while I was at, well, I played 17 times for, for Ireland. Uh, 15 of those appearances were while I was uh, playing for Warsaw Football Club. And it was magnificent to think that uh, I'd be playing at Warsaw or Rochdale or something like that on, on a Saturday and then going away and playing in the Parc de Princes against France or, or, uh, or at Wembley against England, which I did on one occasion, you know, and then you come back and it was it was difficult in some ways to to cope with the change uh, and, and at that level it, it was marvelous for a third division goalkeeper to go away and play on that sort of stage yes while alan buckley's team never rose above the third division in the cup competitions they sparkled this scorcher from gary childs against shrewsbury set up a league cup visit to a familiar foe the mighty arsenal again for Arsenal and Jennings half got it away back from Priest Brown and it's in from Mark Rees and how they deserve that equaliser and O'Leary really late
favouring now could be costly yet for Arsenal and allow though Kelly possession. Priest. And White must play Brown! The town was alive once again to a cup run as history repeated itself in such dramatic fashion. But the celebrations weren't over yet. Anfield beckoned, but first stop was Rotherham. The first goal, a tried and tested formula, straight down the middle, Mark Rees doing well on a greasy pitch. Well, as you'd expect, it gave Walsall confidence, and Gary Charles might have hoped for better from this effort. But on a wet night, home team Rotherham had their chances and goalkeeper Ron Green had to make a double save to keep Walsall one ahead. The man who grabbed all the headlines was David Priest, and well he might, a skilled player in midfield, even in difficult circumstances, and a fine striker of the ball. But a goal wasn't too long coming. A half clearance offered a second chance, and from the cross, Richard O'Kelly found space and a gaff over the goalkeeper's outstretched arms. Walsall's confidence and self-belief was high, and from Brian Caswell's cross, Ali Brown headed them further ahead. It wasn't entirely one-way traffic. Rotherham found themselves space in the penalty area, and 3-1 it was. But the result was put beyond doubt when Richard O'Kelly kept his feet to slide a through ball to Mark Rees. Not completely cleanly hit, but they all count. Gary Charles was destined not to score that night, a lob for the far corner, and not for the first time, he deserved better. But a measure of Walsall's night was perfectly illustrated by Mark Rees. He'd always try anything, and he did. Before the final whistle, Rotherham got the benefit of a minor ricochet and from some nifty footwork, but a second consolation goal. But suddenly for Walsall, it was Anfield next stop. Robinson, Rush, and it's going to run on for Ronnie Wheeler. O'Kelly's coming near post and the defence is having to work hard to get the ball away and O'Kelly and was it over the line it's a goal now Neil Nickel Oh, Pasmoa, outside in Johnston, really driven, and it's there by Ronnie Whelan, he's got his second. Can Walsall come yet again, Priest, oh a chance here for Summerfield, it's 2-2, amazing stuff, the Summers scored straight from the kickoff. A two-all draw at Anfield surpassed even their own expectations, although it didn't prevent daydreams of even greater glory. The thing, the thing with last night is that uh, we had to make sure that the game wasn't over with last night. We had to make sure that we didn't get beat three goals so that next Tuesday was a formality, really. We had to just keep ourselves in the game. And, and to be perfectly honest, we surpassed that. We got in a, a draw that which no one could have dreamt about before the game. And so Tuesday will be a li little bit special now. The return leg meant additional safety work at Fellows Park. By now, the old stadium was clearly showing its age. Tickets for the visit of the league leaders were like gold dust. The Liverpool building with so much accuracy. And they're threatening again now with Johnston. To Whelan. Good save. Whelan again. The Liverpool fans spill onto the pitch behind the goal. And Ronnie Whelan has done it yet again. Seven minutes into the second half. The barrier has collapsed behind the goal. As the Liverpool fans celebrate the second goal, there could be enormous problems here now. Certainly everybody just poured forward then as William shot hit the back of the net. And there could well be a delay here. And this problem is 
sort it out. It was the end of a famous cup run, but Walsall continued to entertain their fans. This 5-3 win over Derby in the Freight Rover Trophy, typical of their carefree approach to the game. One goal down from the first leg, Mark Rees scored his second to make it 2-1 on the night. Then Steve Elliott kept his balance to make it 3-1. A defensive blunder this time, and Elliott's there to make it 4-1. Seemingly home and dry, Walsall then contrived to allow Bobby Davidson to grab two opportunist goals to level the tie. But watch now for the skills of Ian Handysides in creating the winner for Mark Rees. His name will never be forgotten at Walsall. Well, I had a phone call one evening um, when someone rang me to say that uh, Mr. Walden had an interest in disposing of the the ground at Ellis Park and transferring us to, to Wolverhampton Wanderers because he has an interest at that time in, in uh, going to Wolverhampton and I think he was competing with the people who are there now and um, it was a very difficult time because I, I realised that once we had lost Fellas Park uh, that we'd really lost Warsaw Football Club because everybody who uh, had any affection for Walsall football, I had the same affection for Fellas Park, and I knew that people would not, you know, go to Wolverhampton and, and, and watch the team there. So I saw the danger at that time of losing the club, and obviously it's a club I've loved and lived with for so long. So um, I decided to to try and form a, a Save Walsall Action Group uh, in the in 82-83 season. What I never well, I totally underestimated, really, was the response that we would get from not just from the fans, but from the town itself. You know, the town came alive with this campaign to save the club. And uh, we feel that uh, Mr. Weldon backed off at the last minute, and, um, and at that time, in 83, and uh, the Wolves went to Derek Dugan and the um, Barties. But I think we always realised that at some stage Mr. Weldon would realise his dreams of disposing of Fellas Park and transferring the club to another ground. Uh, so we, although the Save Walsh Action Group went into, uh, into retirement for a while, we did keep it alive from, you know, and kept keeping aware of things, you know, that uh, watching every move that Mr. Weldon was making. And um, by when he's when in, in 85 in December 85 when he did go to Birmingham as chairman retained his interest in Warsaw Football Club uh, you know the panic was really on because this was for real this time and um, it was very important that uh, Mr. Weldon I, I felt that Mr. Weldon would certainly get the support of the Football League who at that time were very keen to get clubs to ground share uh, that the only way we could prevent that was to find someone who would buy the club from Mr. Wilder. Um, I saw that uh, chemicals went up, didn't they, but the other stock came down. Are you still happy about that? All right, I mean, the market seems to be going up, but the, this particular area is not getting okay. What you, Terry Ramsden, in international financier and high-profile racehorse owner, was reputedly worth £150 million. Pounds. But why'd he be interested in buying a third division football club? Terry Ramsden, yeah, a remarkable character, really. Um, we were desperately looking for somebody within the town, hopefully, to, to buy the club from Mr. Weldon. And we generated sufficient interest, we felt, in the town for somebody to come forward. But nobody did. 
and uh, so we then realised that uh, we've got to look outside of Walsall to try and find a buyer. And uh, I went to the barber, which I don't very often do, as you can see, and I was reading this article in a newspaper, and uh, a little guy there being led out with his, leading some horses out, and the picture there, and there's this article on Terry Ramsden. And the final paragraph in this article was that um, the, the interviewer had asked him what his next ambition was, and he said, I want to buy a first division football club. So I thought, well, if I can get him to buy a third division football club, and uh, then we're on our way. So I tracked him down through company's house and um, finally found his company out and rang him one Friday lunchtime. And uh, I always remember the conversation, you know, he, he said, um, I rang him, his secretary said, I'm sorry, he's unavailable, but I'm going to ring you back. And I said, said what's it about? I said, well, it's about buying a football club. So anyway, about 10 minutes later, he rang me back. And uh, he said, what football club are you talking about? I said, Walsall. He said, where the bloody hell is that? Ramsden's first sight of the town, with Tommy Coakley already in tow, was in December 1986. Yeah, to, uh, just you meet the council and look at Walsall Football Club and uh, I'm interested in buying it and here to meet the people and see if the town's behind the club as it seems to be, basically. Now, uh, uh, what's your interest in football? We know you're a big horse racer. <laughs> well, I have a lot of interest, boxing, football, horse racing. Uh, you know, I've, still, I've been expanding my racing interests and uh, I'm expanding my football interests. And I'll be expanding my boxing interests. So, from the Walsall fans' point of view today, what can they expect from your visit, do you think? Well, we'll uh, we're going to meet all the guys, and uh, I want to talk to everybody and have a look at the situation for myself. Um, there seems to be a tremendous following for the club from the town, and that's basically what I want to find out if that really is the case, and if there's a job to be done here. Okay, that's true. Well, Elton Johnson, do I suppose I can do? <laughs> I hope. The summer of '87 saw the deal completed. The Ramsden entourage arrived with typical extravagance, with the fans out in force to welcome the club's new saviour. tell you, any old age pensioners there are, we're going to have a special gate made. You will all get in free for every home game throughout the season. <laughs> Second thing is, if you manage to get to ten games, we give you a turkey at Christmas. <laughs> I, want, I want that to be a lesson to every supporter. We're here to do the business. I'm supporting the club. You support me. We're going to go all the way. All right. 